welcome everybody to this edition of the Singapore Convention Mediation Online Seminar Series, uh, brought to you by IMI and our friends at CIMI as well. I'm Laura Skillen, the Executive Director of the International Mediation Institute, and we've also got Marcus Lim as CEO of CIMI on as well. Um, for those who haven't joined us before and who haven't used this webinar function before, you will notice that there's a big Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or on your phone as well. So if you do have questions as John is talking or something you'd like to bring up, please submit them via the Q&A section and we'll get to those um, after John's presentation. But with no further ado, I think we've got uh, John Brand here today. He's a mediator in South Africa, a former trainer for the International Labour Organization. He's accredited or certified with both CIMI and with IMI, and I believe he's uh, well known to many of you joining us today. So thank you, John. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Laura, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you out there, and thanks very much to IMI and to Simi for inviting me to speak to you uh, today. Um, I think, as you know, the, the topic which I've been asked to address is South Africa and the Singapore Convention. And what I propose to do is to uh, briefly uh, remind you of what the uh, underlying intention behind the Singapore Convention, which for those of you who don't know, is more fully called the United Nations Convention on International Settlement Agreements resulting from mediation. Uh, and the title, I think, indicates one of its primary purposes, and that is to deal with the enforceability of uh, cross-border mediated settlement agreements. Um, then what I want to do is to explain to you how South Africa could benefit from the uh, convention if it gets its uh, ducks in a row and then uh, suggest uh, what it is that South Africa needs to do in order to sign and to ratify the convention, and then to explore what stands in the way of South Africa reaping the full benefits of the convention. And then at the end, uh, I will do my best to answer any questions which you may have uh, concerning my uh, my talk. So let me kick off right away with uh, looking at what the purpose of the convention is. Now, I know that may be familiar to, um, to many of you, but it's worth uh, reminding ourselves <clears throat> that um, apart from enforcement, one of its primary purposes uh, is to elevate the status of cross-border mediation across the world in a similar way to which the New York Convention has done for cross-border uh, international arbitration. Uh, the intention is also to facilitate international trade and commerce by enabling disputing parties to easily enforce mediation settlement agreements across borders. Um, and then it's also intended to assist businesses to benefit from the uh, many uh, advantages of mediation uh, as an additional dispute resolution option to the typical litigation and arbitration option used for settling cross-border disputes. And I think this is uh, really very important because um, particularly for those of you that are familiar with mediation, you know that the mediator's role is not to adjudicate on the dispute like an arbitrator or a judge, but rather to independently facilitate negotiation between disputing parties 
and to seek to help them arrive at a mutually acceptable settlement, uh, which is of greater value to them uh, than what they could achieve in adjudicative processes like arbitration and, uh, and, and mediation. Um, mediation is also uh, very valuable, as we know, because it is far more flexible, cheaper, time efficient than processes like litigation and arbitration and can be of great assistance um, to international trade and investment if it is more widely used. And the problem prior to the convention was that um, there was a lack of certainty in the minds of parties that mediated settlement agreements could be enforced in many countries. Um, and I think what we need to understand is that unlike arbitration awards and court orders, which are frequently not complied with and which need to be enforced by the courts, very few mediated settlement agreements, in fact, need to be enforced by the courts because they are consensual. People have agreed to that outcome. They are not having the outcome imposed on them by a, a, a third party. But notwithstanding uh, this limited need for enforcement, there was a perception out there uh, that the, 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 in the event of a mediated settlement agreement not being complied with, there may be problems in enforcing them in certain uh, jurisdictions. So the key aim of the convention is to address enforceability. And so what the convention provides is that if the mediation and the mediated agreement comply with the conditions laid down in the convention, then the courts of a party to the convention must enforce the agreement. And those requirements are nothing extraordinary for uh, countries that are uh, familiar with mediation. Um, and so it's relatively easy for um, most countries to comply with the convention, sign it and ratify it. So that in, in summary is the purpose and intention behind the uh, convention. What I want to turn to now is to also just briefly look at um, how South Africa could benefit from the convention if it was to go ahead sign and then ratify it. And what it would do uh, if it did that is that it would signal to the world, firstly, that it wants to facilitate foreign trade with and investment in South Africa. And it would also tell the world that it is easy to enforce mediated settlement agreements in South Africa in the unlikely event that a party failed to comply with the agreement. Uh, it would also signal that the country recognizes mediation as an important process for the settlement of cross-border commercial disputes. And importantly, that it wants business to benefit from mediation as an additional dispute resolution option to arbitration and litigation for the settlement of cross-border commercial disputes. And by doing this, South Africa could encourage much needed foreign trade and investment, which is sorely, sorely needed at this time. So that uh, in brief is uh, how South Africa could benefit from the convention if it is to sign and ratify it. 
Let me then uh, turn now to look at what South Africa needs to do uh, in order to compete with best practice in the world and with its competitors for foreign trade and investment. Um, and realize that uh, one of its highest priorities should be uh, in order to do that, to sign and ratify the convention. And in order to be able to ratify the convention, what South Africa needs to do is to enact domestic and international mediation legislation, which is aligned with the UNCTRAL model law on mediation and aligned with the Singapore Convention. And uh, this involves, among other things, having in place proper standards of ethics, training, ongoing development, accreditation, and discipline for mediators. And similarly, uh, the country needs to have proper standards for mediation service providers. Fortunately uh, for South Africa, um, a lot of work has been done in these areas by DISAC, the Dispute Settlement Accreditation Council, which is an organization where all the main private um, alternative dispute resolution providers uh, came together with a view to putting in place um, world-class mediation uh, standards. Uh, and therefore, as I speak, we have in place all those necessary standards, all the standards that the convention uh, requires. Uh, in addition, the South African Law Reform Commission, ADR Advisory Committee, uh, has been actively endeavoring to convert this work into appropriate legislation to recommend to the government for enactment, and that work is uh, fairly advanced. Um, South Africa also has the advantage of having a, a large number of commercial mediators who have been trained and accredited to international standards, and many of whom have gone on to be accredited by international service providers like uh, the Centre for Effective Dispute Resolution in the UK, IMI and SIMI, and uh, these mediators include several top ex-judges, many top advocates, attorneys, accountants, uh, company CEOs, and uh, other professionals. Uh, and so South Africa will have very little difficulty in complying with the convention or in providing mediators to perform cross-border mediation up to world standards if it signs, ratifies the convention and cross-border um, mediation kicks off in the country. Uh, furthermore, in the event of mediation not being successful, South Africa also has a long-standing and well-developed voluntary arbitration system, which is also comparable with international best practice. And as recently as uh, December 2017, the International Arbitration Act came into operation and it incorporates the UNCTRAL model law into South African uh, law and regulates voluntary cross-border arbitration in South Africa. So overall, South African mediation and arbitration practice 
is consistent with modern international best practice and is ready to handle disputes between foreign investors, traders, and South African parties. But as I will explain, what is standing in the way of South Africa making full use of this readiness and expertise is the inaction and the approach of the South African government towards independent international mediation and arbitration. So let me again briefly uh, explain to you what is standing in the way of South Africa reaping the full benefits of the uh, convention. I think as I've already indicated what is immediately standing in the way of South Africa benefiting from the convention is the government's inaction and failure to simply sign the convention. Um, signature, as I've indicated, would show to the world that South Africa supports all that the convention stands for and that it will be taking the necessary steps to ratify the convention. 46 countries, including many of South Africa's competitors for foreign trade and investment, literally rushed to sign the convention at its launch in Singapore on the 7th of August, 2019. But to the best of my knowledge, the South African government was totally absent, was not uh, represented there uh, at all. And since then, three countries have, uh, that signed the convention have already ratified it, and eight more have signed it since the, the launch. Now, some lawyers will correctly say that strictly speaking, it is unnecessary for South Africa to sign and ratify the convention because in terms of the South African common law, mediated settlement agreements, including cross-border ones, are just like all other contracts enforceable in South Africa. But notwithstanding this, for the reasons that I've explained, foreign investors need the comfort of knowing that by signing the convention, South Africa has signaled its support and that it will ratify it. And therefore, they can safely know that mediated settlement agreements will be enforced in South, uh, in South Africa. And all that South Africa needs to do now in order to give foreign business and investors the comfort they need in this regard is to send a representative to sign it at the United Nations headquarters in New York. It doesn't have to do anything more than that as far as I understand the position. And notwithstanding entreaties to do this, the South African government has without any explanation that I have seen failed to, to do so, which is extraordinary bearing in mind the need we have to send out a positive signal to foreign investors. So intentionally or not, the failure, instead of signaling to the world that uh, South Africa is a mediation friendly place, it is sending out the signal that South Africa does not support the convention and all that it stands for, and that it won't be taking the necessary steps to, uh, to ratify it. So my biggest hope is that the government will realize the damage that this uh, signal is doing to the country's prospects of foreign trade and investment, and that it signs the convention as soon as possible. Unfortunately, even if it does that, there is a bigger and more complex obstacle to overcome before South Africa can fully reap the benefits of the convention. And that 
obstacle is its approach to the protection of foreign investor rights in the country. And I don't have time uh, in this presentation to go into much detail here, but let me just as quickly as possible say that South Africa terminated 20 of its bilateral investment treaties, which protected foreign investors from, among other things, expropriation, and which guaranteed them fair and equitable treatment and full protection and security in the country. The bilateral investment treaties also provided that these uh, foreign investor rights would be enforced by international arbitration. Now, instead of this, what uh, the government uh, did um, was to enact the so-called Protection of Foreign Investment Act, which provides that foreign investors can request the government to agree to mediation of disputes about their treatment in the country. And if the government agrees, so it's voluntary, the government may appoint a mediator of its choice, not an agreed mediator, to mediate those disputes. And at present, the identity and the qualifications of those mediators are unknown. And hardly surprisingly few, if any foreign investors, have chosen this route because uh, I'm sure as all of us mediators know, parties not likely to agree to uh, mediation where one party chooses the mediator and the mediator is therefore neither independent or perceived to be independent and there are no express qualifications for that mediator, uh, th those um, mediators. Um, in addition, if the government refuses to mediate uh, or should mediation fail, if they do agree to go to mediation, then foreign investors are required to depend on the South African constitution and the local courts for the protection of their rights. And whatever ideological merits, and there are ideological arguments in favor of this particular approach by the government, it has sent a very negative message to foreign investors uh, regarding the long-term protection of their investments in South Africa. Because as we know, uh, generally across the world, foreign investors are willing to invest and to create jobs in a country, but they are reluctant to have their property rights put at risk or to have to contribute to the country's social engineering beyond paying taxes and royalties. And I think we all know that at present there is much competition for foreign investment. Investors have alternatives to South Africa that do provide them with environments that are far more attractive than the one which South Africa is offering by its inaction in relation to the convention and its approach to, um, to, to the protection of um, international investors. So hopefully the South African government may be forced by the economic collapse, which even preceded the COVID crisis, but which has been severely aggravated by the COVID crisis to introduce reforms that are necessary to promote foreign trade and investment. So let me quickly summarize the essence of what I've been trying to get across to you. Um, in, in essence, I'm saying that South Africa's mediation and arbitration is in a state which could enable it to take advantage of the convention but without swift action to sign and ratify it, and without major reform to foreign investor protection, there is really little prospect of it being able to take full advantage of the convention, which uh, if it did act, could help it at this stage with the 
economic recovery that is so crucial at this time. So that's, that's all that I'm able to get across to you in the limited time that I have, but I'm very happy to do my best to answer whatever questions you, you have for me. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, John. That was very interesting. And we already have a couple of questions, and if people have others, they can submit them as well. But we have a question here from Jonathan Barnes, and he asks, do you foresee any policy factors inhibiting South Africa from signing and ratifying the convention? Look, I'm not a, I'm not a politician, and I'm not an economist. What is standing in the way uh, is the current policies of the South African government, which frankly are hostile to, uh, to independent um, mediation and arbitration. And you can see that in the so-called Protection of Investment Act, where they don't buy into the idea of independent uh, mediators. And they are, um, they, they do not accept the, the needs and concerns of foreign investors. Their ideology is that if foreign investors want to come here, they must come here on South Africa's terms and they must contribute to South Africa's transformation, which includes risking expropriation of their property, uh, being forced to have uh, certain quotas of black shareholders, certain quotas of black employees, uh, of having certain conditions applied to them to get licenses and so on. So th th there are fundamental government policies standing in the way. And until uh, there is a change of attitude, um, I don't see us making much progress in, in, in this area. Mm -hmm. okay. I hope that answers your, your question, Jonathan. Okay. All right, and I'm, I'm going to be really cheeky and throw in my own question. I mean, do you see it that South Africa has a particular role to play via the mediation in the region? I mean, what opportunities are there for South Africa, do you think? The huge opportunities, <clears throat> apart from the economic advantages of attracting um, international investment and trade, I, I might be um, uh, blowing South Africa's own trumpet. But I don't think there's any other country in Africa that has more than 500 trained and accredited commercial mediators, uh, trained and accredited to world standards. We also have a deep heritage of mediation, both in our indigenous law and through the apartheid period where we introduced um, mediation in the labor area, and in the community and the political area. Um, uh, our, our mediators have gone on to uh, be active in the international sphere in the Basque country in Northern Ireland and uh, elsewhere. So we have a rich mediation culture uh, and tradition just waiting to be used. But coming back to Jonathan's question is that the judges in the country and the government have, it seems to me, an ideological problem with working with the private sector and working with those private uh, mediators. Um, so yes, if, if we could unlock that, uh, we could become not only a center in Southern Africa for all mediation, including cross-border mediation, but perhaps together with countries like Nigeria, uh, and Mauritius and some others, leaders in Africa, but government policy is holding us back. Absolutely. And we've got a question here from Joy Mango, which is related. And she asks, other than South Africa, what is your take on the place of mediation in Africa as a whole continent? I think it's enormously important uh, on the continent. I mean, one of the things that we haven't even begun to address on the continent, as compared with countries like Canada that I follow quite closely, is access to justice. 
And the fact of the matter is that the, the vast mass of Africans have no access to justice because it is simply too expensive, too complicated. And one of the great virtues of mediation is that it can be uh, easily and inexpensively made available to people and give them access to both civil justice, uh, community justice. So there's a massive uh, role for it. And one of the great things about the convention, apart from enforceability, is that it's elevating the status of mediation and hopefully starting to make people realize what a very important and serious process it is. Our challenge is to persuade lawyers, judges, governments, uh, and demonstrate to them the potential it holds. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, we've got a question here from Joyce, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your last name, but Alawak or Alawaj. He says, thank you for this talk, firstly. And she asks, my country, Kenya, is in the same position, not signing or ratifying at this point. And so she's actually, sorry, I just realized it's a comment more than a question. But she, she said that she appreciates your, uh, your contributions there. Um, we've got a question here from Barney Jordan. He says that it sounds like the government's reluctance might be ideological. Which interest groups may be the most appropriate to try and influence its thinking? It's a very, very difficult question to answer. Um, we have been trying for years to uh, get to government, to get to the judiciary, to get to the legislature, and quite frankly, we have failed. Um, and I really am not sure what we do, perhaps what will make a difference is when foreign investors um, and foreign governments put pressure on our government and say, you've got nothing to fear, you've got everything to gain by this. But certainly my own entreaties uh, have gone, gone nowhere and I'm at a bit of a loss. Perhaps the audience out there uh, might have some ideas. And actually that's another point is that I really think the whole mediation community needs to think about how it can uh, market mediation to, uh, to the legislature, to the executive and to the judiciary and not leave it to one or two uh, of us to try uh, to, to do that. It sounds like perhaps there's a call as well to create a South African-based community so you can have these discussions and think about these interest groups and how to, uh, how to approach them as well. Would a settlement agreement of a cross-border mediation, for example, South Africa versus Singapore, conducted in Singapore by a certified mediator, but not administered by a designated mediation service provider, be enforceable in South Africa? Yes, I think it would, um, because the, the, the question is simply whether it is a binding contract in terms of our common law, and provided the parties were capacitated and there was uh, an intention to agree all the normal uh, tests that apply to a binding contract, whether it was reached in Singapore or in South Africa, my understanding of the law, and it is a little bit rusty, last time I actively practiced law was about 40 years ago, but that, that would be my understanding, that it would be enforceable, even without us signing or ratifying the, the convention, simply in terms of our, our common law, as I say, the importance of signing and ratifying is the signal that it gives. Great. We have a question from Mercy Akiru, who says, great talk. And she's interested to know your views on the ISDS reforms that South Africa has made. She asks, is it your opinion that foreign direct investment will actually be affected because of that? Some states have shown that FDI isn't necessarily tied to inflow. Just want to know your views. Well, if, if, you, if you're talking of reform being the cancellation 
adoption of 20 bilateral investment treaties and the enactment of the so-called Protection of Investment Act, then I would say it's going to be very negatively affected. What we need is um, radical reform of uh, the um, international dispute settlement uh, regime here to introduce appropriate protection for investors and independent uh, adjudication of disputes in that regard, all of which South Africa has done away with. Um, there's no positive reform on the, the table at all. And we have a related uh, question from your colleague, Marianne Shea at Conflict Dynamics, I believe. And she says, notwithstanding the font of mediation experience that already exists, I'm assuming including yourself, Conflict Dynamics has been planning to train investor state mediators. Do you think this will contribute to a groundswell towards the acceptance of the protocols? I think it, it will contribute to that. I think that uh, notwithstanding the, um, the, the, the extent of um, my negativity, if I can call that, there will be uh, cross-border um, international mediation in South Africa, and uh, it will be capable of being enforced in terms of our common law. And there is a need for commercial mediators who are not only qualified and accredited as generic commercial mediators, but who also have the additional qualification uh, of international um, cross-border mediation. Uh, and so I think it will contribute if we can say to the world, not only do we have a large number of commercial mediators, but we also have a panel of mediators that have had advanced uh, training. It will help. And also I think the more we get out there and get into, and I'm finding this, the more we talk to uh, ex-judges and senior advocates and senior attorneys who come on our courses to be trained as mediators, the more the scales drop from their eyes and they see the potential. So yes, I think conflict dynamics can do uh, a lot to advance it. Super. And we have a question from Saeed Musa Khalifa, who says that you have some association with labor disputes. Apart from commercial disputes, what impact do you think the convention will have on South Africa's Commission for Conciliation, Mediation and Arbitration? Well, um, it will have no direct impact on that because we must remember that what uh, the, the Commission for uh, the CCMA is dealing with is national internal disputes between employees and their South African employers and uh, between uh, unions and their employers. They are not cross-border disputes and therefore the convention has no direct impact on those uh, or any other national uh, interest South African disputes. It only impacts cross-border disputes. But the, the, the elevation of mediation the elevation of its status uh, will, I think, assist the attitude of people to CCMA mediation. But I don't think it's going to have any um, immediate, substantial, direct impact on the CCMA. Mm -hmm. A question then from Suhail Mohammed, who says that if the convention requires that South African courts enforce these mediation agreements, would the parties to these agreements not still be subjected to the risks that are embedded in South African law? Say, for instance, BEE policies, since these courts will interpret these agreements through the lens of South African domestic law. Um, yes or no. Um, the, 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 what I'm thinking about is that the, it's unlikely that an agreement that has been entered into by a South African party and a, and a foreign trader or a foreign investment 
uh, or is going to um, contain material that the courts would have to intervene with. Um, it's a common law contract and they would give effect to it. Um, there have been some perverse judgments coming out of our, our, our courts um, which do, uh, do strange things in the area of transformation. But I don't think that that is a major threat. I mean, these are commercial contracts that are unlikely to impinge there. It's, it works the other way around, is that what South Africa will have to accept if it wants foreign investment is that uh, international arbitration applying standard bilateral investment uh, treaties uh, will find that requirements that a mining company must have 30% black shareholding is in flagrant breach of the uh, protection against uh, equitable treatment and that certainly expropriation uh, with or without compensation is going to breach the bilateral investment treaties. And it was because of that that South Africa cancelled the, the bilateral investment treaties, but in doing that it's also cancelled uh, investment. So it's, it's going to have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. Great. And so we have a question from an anonymous attendee, which always gives it an air of mystery. What role do you feel lawyers in South Africa play, or I guess could play, in influencing investors to use mediation, regardless of whether or not the Singapore Convention is actually signed? I think they can play an enormous role, as they can, in promoting mediation for domestic use. Um, they, what they need to do, and one of the challenges we face, is to educate lawyers about the advantages of mediation, what it really does as to pose what they perceive it to, to do, and to, uh, to uh, make them appreciate that internationally mediation is becoming mainstream. And if they are not able to advise foreign clients to go that route and to draw the appropriate uh, agreements to mediate, to help their clients prepare for the mediation, to represent them in that, that mediation, they're going to be at a major disadvantage. So uh, again, one of the things we try to do in Conflict Dynamics and other uh, organisations is to uh, run courses for lawyers uh, to help them appreciate what mediation is, to uh, train them in how to uh, uh, draft appropriate agreements to mediate and settlement agreements and how to help their clients prepare because mediation is a facilitated negotiation and so lawyers have to change their role from being gladiators to negotiators. They need to be equipped with uh, modern negotiation um, um, skill and theory, be able to help their, their clients prepare for a sophisticated negotiation uh, and represent them there. So there are huge opportunities for lawyers um, and we've got a lot of work to, to do in that area. Mm -hmm. And actually that brings us to another question which is quite related um, because they've commented that they doubt practicing legal practitioners and the courts will be keen to promote mediation because they would rather see matters go through the courts and therefore make their fees there. Um, I mean, what, what's your take on that? How, how can we get lawyers on board, I suppose, is the question. Well, one of the ways, and I mean, we've seen it across the world, and it's where our judiciary has led us down terribly in this country, is by judicial activism. The, the thing that has really changed the approach of lawyers to mediation in many jurisdictions is punitive cost awards if they do not uh, advise um, their clients about mediation uh, and if their clients unreasonably refuse to go to mediation and with very few exceptions in South Africa. I can think of three cases where judges have um, 
intervened and given some degree of punishment to people who have unreasonably refused mediation. Our judges uh, almost appear to be hostile to, uh, to independent mediation. And that's got to change. When that changes, when we can get the judges to, uh, to apply what I think is law anyway, we recently introduced in South Africa a rule 41 capital A, which also kind of pussyfoots around it and very indirectly says uh, parties must consider mediation um, and the judges may take their consideration into account. It doesn't boldly say lawyers must advise their clients and parties must mediate or have reasonable uh, grounds not to mediate and that judges may uh, and should grant adverse costs awards. But it's there, it's a move in the right di direction. What we want to see is uh, how many judges take up the opportunity they've got under 41 capital A to get South Africa to move into the modern uh, dispute resolution world. Great. And just sort of getting back to this idea of the judiciary, how actively do you think the South African judiciary actually promotes the use of mediation? And how could they be doing more to encourage South Africa to sign the convention? They give the example that there's uh, no consideration of mediation resulting in adverse cost orders. I'm not sure what the full sentence is there, sorry. But... Well, I haven't seen, apart from one or two judges that were mediators and who then were elevated onto the bench are trying to do something in their courts. Uh, the judicial leadership is silent. Um, I haven't seen any of them speak out, not, not even about access to justice, let alone mediation. They seem to be obsessed with the protection of their adjudicative turf uh, and uh, the protection of lawyers' uh, litigation turf. I just don't see it. And we've engaged with... Um, numerous judges. We've offered them the panels of mediators. Uh, nothing has come of it. Um, there's been some strange moves uh, within the judiciary to have themselves trained as mediators, to mediate in their, their courts, which uh, is extraordinary, bearing in mind that the courts are hopelessly overloaded with litigation. They don't have the capacity to, in addition, take on mediation. Secondly, there's serious constitutional questions about whether judges uh, are entitled in terms of the constitution to, uh, to, to mediate. And it's also extraordinary that they can be taking time off to train themselves as mediators when we've got over 500 qualified and accredited mediators desperate to assist the uh, the civil justice system to with mediation. So we need to open up a, a very frank conversation with judges if they want to have that conversation. Absolutely. Um, so I've got a question here from Felicity Sedman. What can lawyers do to ensure judge to engage judges? Sorry, to engage judges to get parties to use mediation in the High Court? Well, I think that we've got to use every opportunity that we have uh, with judges that we know, that is judges who've been through mediated training and appreciate its benefits, to uh, continually speak to them, to ask them uh, how we can help them and their fellow judges, how we can help them to educate uh, the, the the judges, um, and th that um, we should uh, encourage uh, judges to come on the training, the, the, the very short training, introducing them to what mediation is and how it actually uh, 
uh, can result in outcomes to both parties which are of greater value to both parties than the best outcomes both of them could get in litigation. We need to utilize every opportunity uh, to engage with them. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the best I can, I can think of. For sure. Uh, I think this is a follow-up, so I'm going to ask it. Felicity asks, um, is it not the case that lawyers make applications to the court for orders? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, there, there are some good examples, and there's one recent one where a, an activist attorney who also happens to be somebody who's been trained as a mediator, but she's a, a litigant in the, in the court, um, applied for an order from the court to compel a reluctant party to consider going to mediation in that particular dispute and to uh, uh, consider making adverse costs award against that party uh, if that party unre unreasonably refuses to go to mediation. So yes, activist lawyers uh, could uh, could do a lot in that kind of area. And it comes even before making application to court. At an early stage uh, in uh, litigious disputes is to invite the other party to go to mediation, invite them if they refuse to give their reasons for doing that, and to inform them that, uh, that if they don't go to mediation and they reasonably refuse, that refusal is going to be placed before the judge when the matter gets to court. Because one of the other things is, as uh, Rule 41 capital A is, it only kicks in at the stage that a party commences litigation. But we know that there's a great role for mediation much earlier in the play, long before parties have spent vast sums of money uh, in the litigious process, uh, which gets them to uh, the actual issue of summons or the launch of an application. So yeah, a lot that, that uh, activist lawyers can do. Super. And so people keep submitting questions. So we'll, I think we've got time for one more and then we'll finish up. And I'm gonna use my own privilege to, uh, to actually jump in here again. Because I, I'd sort of like to bring this to a close and maybe have a bit of a summary and idea of what we want to work towards. I mean, from your perspective, what should mediation look like in South Africa 10 years from now, for example? Well, I think that it should be mainline, that it should be almost unthinkable for parties in any dispute, and I'm not just talking about civil disputes in the courts, I'm talking about neighborhood, community, um, family, uh, environmental, um, every conceivable area of, uh, of conflict and dispute, and particularly I want to emphasize access to justice down in the community, that there would be uh, an understanding of the value of mediation. There will be uh, mediators that are competent at whatever level to perform uh, mediation. And that uh, right up to the highest level of uh, international cross-border mediation, no dispute would go on to the use of arbitration or litigation or boycott or power without having uh, properly exhausted uh, an endeavor to, to, to mediate it. So we need the development of not just high level professional mediators to mediate cross-border uh, disputes, but uh, a mass of mediators uh, down into the community and even at schools, fuss busters, whatever you want to call them, uh, we need to realize the, the, the potential of facilitated negotiation to achieve outcomes for parties 
which are better than what other processes offer uh, and which uh, are cheaper, quicker, more accessible, simpler, etc. That's my dream. Perfect. And a fantastic dream it is. Well, thank you so much for this incredibly informative, interesting, and I think inspirational talk. It sounds like our, uh, our participants or our attendees have gotten a lot out of it. So thank you so much for joining us. Great pleasure, Laura. Thanks to the, uh, all those who listened. Perfect. All right, everyone, we will see you next time. Okay, bye. Mm -hmm.